Today's episode of the Gestalt Education Show is brought to you by three of our favorite sponsors, Human Locomotion, Core 360 Bell, and Dynamic Disc Designs. All the information can be found below. By now, you have definitely heard us talk about them, so check out the show notes, click click the links, use the codes, and uh, make sure you support our favorite people. Uh, As always, we got a great episode lined up for you today, and thanks for tuning in. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, we're back on home turf, Brett, today in our, our usual spot. Feels so, good to yeah, it does. Brett. It does. Yeah. So, uh, today we are sitting down with the one and only Dr. Pat Battaglia. So, uh, Pat just helped us out with a little bit of a, some extra knowledge on diagnostic ultrasound, which is what I really know you as, nice, uh, not being nice. a Logan grad and, and uh, kind of things like that. But, Brett, I know you've known Pat for a long time. So, Pat was a superstar student of mine, uh, so we we met then, and then we had many years together. Logan, I've always really, really respected Pat because besides knowing radiology, I felt like um, he was also seeing patients, and he was really good at his clinical reasoning process. And then, uh, yeah, I just always really over the years really trust his opinion on a lot of different things. And uh, and now he evolves in his <laughs> new position, and uh, so I think that you know. Because Pat's always been kind of a leader, so I think like as administrator, I think that I mean that's just kind of makes a lot of sense. I think in your in your journey, but yeah. yeah. So I mean that that kind of takes us to our next round. So can you kind of tell us about your new new journey yeah, uh, outside yeah. of uh, of radiology? Really? No, of course. So that you know, I appreciate the intro, and obviously it means a lot to to be doing this. You know, Brett's been a big mentor of mine for a long time, so I feel like things are, are coming full circle here, which <laughs> yeah. is which is nice, which yeah. is really nice. Um, so I've taken a different role at the University of Western States overseeing all of our community-based clinical education. So at the University of Western States, we got different programs, chiropractic, naturopathic medicine, and others. And um, we're evolving the way we're providing clinical education, really pushing towards a distributed model. Mm-hmm. Traditionally, you know, you go through health science education. I'll focus on chiropractic. Go through chiropractic education. You do a lot of education in a controlled clinic environment, student clinic, on-campus clinic, these sorts of things. We're really reimagining how that clinical education is taking place to make it more distributed for a longer period of time, where students have the opportunity for more real-world diverse experiences with a lot of geographic flexibility. Um, So in my role, I oversee that. I'm really lucky to think strategically about the direction of things and how things go and also be involved in the day-to-day student assignment piece. Yeah, love it. One of the things you know we always talk about we we have right now we have a herd of interns in here, Brett. So it's, it's you just never know what it's going to get. But I think uh, that's something that I really appreciate in my clinical education is like you said, being on boots on ground into right. a clinic where right. really you know shit hits the fan if you want to say right. where you know it's, right. it gets a little chaotic and a less a controlled environment. And I know that you know your your background in in not only clinical education but also clinical treatment is kind of right. uh, mirroring that. So how do you kind of see this blending and, and kind of what's the future of of teaching people in clinic settings? Right, right. Well, you know, I I was really excited about this role um, for the opportunity to be a positive influence in education, health science education, in particular chiropractic education is my background. Um, you know, I, I wasn't excited about the administrative piece, you know, not being with patients is, and not being with students and, and teaching is, is tough. But mm-hmm. w- with that, um, I think we're being really thoughtful. I'm being really thoughtful about not only education for tomorrow, mm-hmm. but education in the future. Mm-hmm. You know, our students that start today, they're going to be in practice in a few years and we kind of know what that looks like but 10 years from now is going to be very different yeah. so i think we got to provide them with real world experiences now that are authentic mm-hmm. and that are many and that are also diverse and by that i mean different people different health systems private mm-hmm. practices integrated systems expose right. them to different payment models how they're going to be paid for what they do and mm-hmm. we need to think about all these things now so they get this in their education mm-hmm. so when they start in practice um, the you know what doesn't feel like it's hitting the fan for them. They can they can kind of take it in stride. Yeah. What are, what are some of the challenges with? I don't know. Maybe I, I put the cart before the the horse a little bit. What is the challenges with education when it comes to bleeding in this clinical aspects and things like that? Like what what are the things that you're really trying to fix, or the things that kind of drew you to put yourself in a position of this? Sure, sure. I think um, as far as just what are the challenges facing all of us at the institutional level. Um, 
time certainly is a big one trying to cram a lot of information into a little bit of time and then also i I think not so much a challenge but maybe something to be thoughtful of is we're not always conscious of of the vision like what do we want the end product to be like what does success look like today in chiropractic education what does it look like in 10 years Mm -hmm. in chiropractic education so the challenge is being agile enough I think to move away from maybe the way we've always done things and think about, okay, what do we need to provide students with today so they can be successful tomorrow and to be flexible backing away from some of our old customs and traditions and no different really than any other industry. Yeah. Yeah. I think the hard thing too is like what, what is the responsibility of the chiropractic college versus what's the responsibility of like us in private practice mm-hmm. when our interns come to us, you know? Right. Sometimes it feels like the cans get kicked to, right. to us right. and we like feel like we're having to do like a bunch of education that sometimes we feel like, oh, maybe that could have been done right. in the colleges versus, you know, right. vice versa or what's the... What's the balance? Well, you know, yeah, what's the balance? I'm so glad you, you brought that up. So one of the goals I have is to create a real learning community where we're learning as an institution from what's happening in the field. But then also, you know, we have the benefit of expertise. We have the benefit of a community of, of academics. And we should be paying it forward, too, and sharing with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I think too often the traditional model, like Brett mentioned, is you do your preclinical stuff, you do some on-campus clinic, and then you go, and then, you know, maybe we're not as involved as we like to be, quite frankly, yeah. not as engaged, right. um, and not as open to feedback. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe what I'm teaching in the classroom is, is not faithful to what's happening in practice, and, and I could learn from that and reconcile mm-hmm. that. So to your question, what's the responsibility? I'm of the opinion it's not really your responsibility uh, solely, it's it's your responsibility to share with administrators such as myself. It's my responsibility um, to equip you with the knowledge and skills to be a good clinical educator. What does it mean to give feedback? What does it mean to orient a learner? Um, what are you doing? What opportunities are you seeing? That sort of thing, and to work with you on that. So I don't think it's any private practitioner's responsibility solely to to do those things. Right. Well, I think like some of the sc- we deal with basically all the schools, and I think some of the schools they worry, they think that like the chiropractor is um, abusing the intern as like you know free right. help, and and we always push back a little bit on our end. We're like, no, 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 like <laughs> right. we, that's not at all what we're doing. We're right. we want the best students to basically integrate our model into that. We're not like looking to abuse the right. the system. And I think like sometimes there gets to be a little bit of a tug of war right. in that. I think, no, that's a good point. That comes up a lot. Um, I think we have a lot of feedback from our current students who are out in community-based placements, and overwhelmingly it's positive. They love the experiences. Um, they love the mentorship. They love being around yeah. real patients, real problems, and just kind of being part yeah, of the team, huge, right? Yeah. So um, we have to rely on that feedback to make sure they're not being utilized for one particular thing. Anytime I onboard a new doctor, I give them the same sort of speech, which is, our expectations are this is an immersive learning experience. Right. You know, at the end of the day, uh, the focus is the patient. So we have to make sure the patient's comfortable, the patient's consenting. Additionally, we respect that there's a business on the back and there's your practice, there's your reputation. So that's another variable Mm -hmm. to consider, right? So both those things have to be met. The patient has to be comfortable, you have to be comfortable. And my hope is we're educating students enough so when they enter these sites, you're impressed and you're comfortable, right? Say, wow, yeah, they're per- ready. Yeah, this person yeah. knows what they're doing and they're ready to take on um, this responsibility. If it's not the case, I hope we can have good discussion on why that's not the case and, and remedy it. So um, I think an immersive learning experience is how we need to think of community based education. They're doing all the things, they're learning all the things, and they feel like they're participating as, as part of the team. It is one of the goals to be placing people in hospital settings and things that I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think, you know, the way I think about our, our chiropractic education, at least, is at least in a few main categories, I think is important for students to get exposure to private practice, of course, um, more retail models. They're becoming more popular. Our students need to know how to function in those settings, I think. Um, and then integrated systems. So VA, non-VA, private hospital, community health center, um, because not only do these offer different patient demographics, they also are different parts of the health system and they're funded differently as well. So I think learning how to navigate each of those is important. The challenge is time. How much can you do with the student? So um, I'm not suggesting every student does everything. (laughs) 
I think we need to identify early in the matching process what's best for that student and get them some alignment too with these different domains of, of practice. Oh, I think that's huge. Cause I mean, with chiropractic kind of being the wild, wild west, how do you match the student to a practice that's going to be kind of what they're, right. you know, to make that right. congruent and right. match? Yeah. yeah. What would you say on that? What, what advice would you have to make make a good match? Like, well, what, I mean, we're the- biased because we have the organizations that we're involved with. That would be uh, MPI, DNS, right. MDT, like that whole, you know. So that makes it a little bit. Uh, obvious and then the other thing too is like if we're around the students right then we kind of know who you know would potentially be a good fit you know? right. something that we've implemented is is uh, an application process which I know you're talking to, to Taylor about earlier mm-hmm. and I think that that is really uh, it, one it makes the students think about like what their actually expectations are for okay. us meaning like it's nice to know what they're trying to get away from us that way we can say okay we can definitely do that or like we can match up in those areas right but maybe the the goals of you are a little bit different than the practice mm-hmm. you know that would be the weeding out process a little bit and so okay. I, I think we have a little bit of a benefit to be selected because we have such a big pool that wants to come see us and see what we do. But it also kind of allows us to, to be upfront and with our expectations on them and kind of the, the experience that they're going to have. And so I think, right. I think that has been something that we've really benefited from in the last year or two that we've, we've implemented that is it's, it just kind of allows us to have an open conversation about, Hey, these are kind of our expectations to our interns. Mm-hmm. Like we don't have a ton of time to like get you caught up to everything. Like if right. there's some holes, that's totally fine. That's, you know, we have education, processes with our our docs and our interns every single day but then right. you know if there's these big gaps it's going to be tough for you to like really integrate in and get the full experience out of it right so, right, right you've noticed the benefit i have yeah, yeah i think we nice. both can say that oh, we yeah. have for yeah, sure yeah. yeah i think you know i think that matching is i think at the end of the day um you know and, and 10 years ago i might have thought this and tried to push people more mm-hmm. um but i think at the end of the day you know use a different term but it's a very ubiquitous profession we got a lot of different faces in, in the healthcare <laughs> system right so um i think we have to be accepting of that and work with students yeah. Yeah. to find a good fit whether mm-hmm. it's higher volume private practice whether it's a sports focus whether it's integrated system etc yeah. because i think we're doing a disservice to the public if we're not um yeah. because our education does provide a core level of good patient mm-hmm. care yeah. how to talk to someone how to recognize something serious how to make sure they can feel better yeah exactly. so you can insert that in a lot of different components of the, of the public and health system, I think. Yeah. Is the goal to get 100% of Tri Nines placed somewhere, or will there always be something that'll be done like on your home turf? So that's our quartered system, and uh, our quarter 10 through 12, our last nine months is our community based program. Um, I wouldn't say this is published, but I, I do think it's a goal. It's a goal of mine to have those last nine months be distributed. Right. Yeah, and there's so many advantages. If you, so the way we're designed this program, the way I think about this program is two things. I think first downstream, the future patients are going to be thankful we had this program because they're going to get a graduate who had nine months of real world experience. Yeah. That's going to be a good thing. Mm-hmm. The second is I think of if I were a student, like what would I really want from a program? Mm-hmm. I would want the opportunity to travel. I'd want the opportunity to be involved with the type of care model that fit well with me. I'd want the opportunity to see real patient real problems and apply what I was learning. Right. So we're trying to do all those things um, for this program. So the short answer is yes. Mm-hmm. We'd like to have the last nine months be in a, compu- in a community-based site, um, just respecting that it's probably the best way to capstone the mm-hmm. education. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, one of the knocks of chiropractic school is not having a residency, right? And so right. Right. what you're kind of describing is a little bit of an immersive, immersive residency right. in that setting. Right. And I think, you know, the nine months, I think, is a good good time frame. Because, mm-hmm. yeah. like, uh, for example, some schools that have trimesters, if we only get them for one trimester, it's hard to, like, right. the, the first month, it's like a new relationship. You know, you're just, like, trying to feel each other out a little bit. And then yeah. the last three months is where a lot of the progress happens. Yeah. And then that's when you can really see. I mean, we've seen people that have been very timid and maybe not sure of themselves turn into absolute superstars right. in the back half of the residency. Right. And so I think right. having that, that full term, if you will, mm-hmm. or that full mm-hmm. setting is what it, that's going to make a huge difference a huge difference i think so too and we've got some flexibility there you know currently students are doing six months in one site three months in the other that mm-hmm. sort of thing which is good i think it mm-hmm. gives them um a little bit of flexibility to travel it gives mm-hmm. them flexibility to get onboarded to a potential associate position sooner right. too which is good right. um 
one other thing we're thinking of you mentioned the residency piece is how do we sort of model that a little bit within mm-hmm. the con within the constraints that we have and we're, we're really trying to think through these longitudinal clinical immersions where students go to a place for six months to nine months and mm-hmm. it's programmed a little bit so the first six months they get some split between a large integrated system and a private practice mm-hmm. 10 to 12 15 hours a week in each and the last three months they can opt in to their preferred setting so they got six months to kind of figure out i like this i didn't like that Mm -hmm. and then the last three months they can opt in as they start to get a career on ramp so it's not perfect it's not the years and years that a residency is but it's you know a little more focused education yeah the other thing the schools they haven't done great probably none of them have like placing people so when the when this is done well like you know our interns come here either we hire them or we have you know 20 people that we would recommend that they they go to which i think mm-hmm. is a real you know our students now not many people come out and start their own practice anymore right. just for a right. lot of different reasons so these people are like needing to be they need literally a matchmaker to like set right. them up with with good situations and i think when this is done well then it it just lends itself to mm-hmm. us saying oh well so and so is looking right. for somebody and i think that's another missing link besides a residency is that it's we're we're, as a profession, we're not good at like placing people yeah. when when they're done. So people are two hundred thousand dollars in debt, and then they and they're like, okay, what, what's the next step? You know. Well, no, you just hit on two really important things for me. The first, you mentioned the matching. Mm-hmm. Uh, thinking a lot about matching. You know, currently we've started to engage our students as they're midway through their education, so we can have six to nine months of discussions mm-hmm. around matching. And and as we've been been doing this and learning. Um, there is a big opportunity for improved career services in this space because I think you need to have some, especially if we talk about chiropractic, I think you need to have some content expertise. You need to kind of know what the field is like Mm -hmm. to advise, you know, it's just, it's, it's different, right? So you need to have an understanding of what these different spaces are like and an understanding of the student to effectively advise. So, uh, it's been a natural evolution for my department to start involving uh, students in almost like a career service type of capacity, just sort of informally, just like you mentioned, I think this would be a good fit. I think that would be a good fit mm-hmm. um, for that reason, you yeah, know, because right. there's good downstream consequences. Cost education is another big one. We're working hard to lower that. Being able to travel is a big step towards that mm-hmm. and go back home for nine months, save money that way, and then have a good career on ramp where you hit the ground running your first year as opposed to maybe struggling your first few years so yeah. those are two small steps in a i'm hopeful longer or bigger direction of, of reducing the cost of education yeah i mean that's 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 the hardest part is right. like trying to trying to promise not promise but to set the groundwork for chiropractic or for the other health sciences in a in a situation where the education matches hopefully a higher pay level right you know right. because as we're, we're continuing i mean we always say like we're primary care physicians and to, we deserve to be paid like primary care physicians right. but then you know setting the students up so that they are well equipped to be that. And I think right. that that is always going to be the struggle of, of right. higher education is putting them in the positions to make sure they can do those things. You know, these opportunities exist though. And mm-hmm. you know, there's great paying jobs for new graduates yep. every day, but it's about identifying them and it's about matching them. And it's about um, not waiting mm-hmm. till graduation to do it, but, but be yeah. proactive. So yeah, I'm really, that. I'm excited. I'm really excited for the future of like our students, you know, but, cause I think there's the biggest demand there probably ever has been for the services we have to offer. Mm-hmm. That's only going to grow. Right. That's only going to grow. Um, and quite frankly, not enough chiropractors practicing to meet that demand. Right. So those that do become chiropractors, I'm, I'm really excited for them. Yeah. Same. I mean, we always do you feel that way. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I genuinely feel that way. I mean, yeah. Because you know. the same. consumer, the patient right now is driving the bus. Right. You know, like we don't need, even really need to educate people anymore on that because people are like searching out, right. you know, people that do, right. are doing what we're, we're doing. And really the beauty of our profession, I mean, you could go all in in functional medicine. You could go all in on just, you know, the manipulation piece you could go all in on re like that's what the beauty of it um it's just i think that you know yeah it's just a little bit right now the times are tough with uh um the inverse relationship of the cost of the education with the reimbursement that's like the thing we got to kind of reconcile Mm -hmm. in the next five to ten years is right um or at least be honest with the people that are coming into the education and being like you know this is Mm -hmm. (laughs) right 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 which maybe that kind of takes us to our next point of 
you know, future chiropractic, obviously we'd all love to get paid more, but with insurance companies driving down the costs, you know, I know that there's great people that are working on legislation and, and things right. like that to get us more inclusive with Medicare. But, you know, what, what do you, I know this is a tough question, but how, how do you, how do we make that change? How do we, is it just that the product is so good that people are willing to pay no matter what? Um, is the the education with the insurance companies, like where, where do you feel like the, the, the heavy medium of that is? Um you're asking about the future of reimbursement chiropractic yeah yeah, yeah all that kind of stuff what uh, you know the naive part of me w wants to talk about like value-based care mm -hmm. right and and being reimbursed for outcomes and so right. on and that's you know things are probably moving that way yeah but there's big legacy players involved that would, mm -hmm. would just as well not have them move that way, right? right. Um, but certainly that's a big, mm -hmm. uh, a, a big avenue for us is right. value-based systems um, that are capitated. You know, in a prior role locally in St. Louis, I was fortunate to be part of a, a capitated value-based system. And it was great. We could just focus on patient care only. And, and it was an amazing thing. And I think those do exist. Mm -hmm. um, not at scale yet, right? But value-based right. models in yeah. some capacity, whether they're bundled or they're capitated, mm -hmm. whatever it looks like. Well, I mean, privatized organizations are starting exactly. to, to move to that. Yep. And I think yep. that that's, maybe that's what pushes the envelope right. between that is, right. you know, employers are driving the bus when it comes to those that was gonna things. Be, that, that's another great point is employer healthcare costs, mm -hmm. right? That's where, you know, I think you'll also see more and more um, feasibility like proof of concept of these mm -hmm. value-based systems and cost right. savings and so on and then on top of that we got to acknowledge a significant number of the population now has one health care provider mm -hmm. and that's the government medicare yep. medicaid mm -hmm. are the dominant health insurer and at some point cost containment you would think is going to also be important mm -hmm. so um again as a chiropractor naively maybe <laughs> yeah, those are good right. things I, what do you all think about that yeah it's hard i think like the the hard part with outcome based um you know, outcome based, and Brett and I've talked about that a lot. Is like sometimes these cases are so convoluted and complicated that there's right. not always an outcome. You know, so we see a ton of chronic pain patients in here sure. and things like that. That sometimes they just need someone to manage their case, and so then the outcome based repayments don't make a ton of sense in those in acute injuries right in in the place right, of workplace right. and stuff like that i think it makes a ton of sense however once you get kind of over that realm of people that maybe you're looking for more of a pain management solution right. versus a solution right it, that's where it gets a little convoluted i think in those setting though it's you know we have to rely on the the data what's effective mm -hmm. right the non-farm therapies all are providing and then it's about diversion too would you rather do this or would you rather right. do that you'd rather do something that's safe and cost effective yeah. and right and and clinically effective mm -hmm. you know there's a patient value piece there too that's right. really important and we talk about you mentioned earlier is it going to be just so good patients are going to pay out of pocket mm -hmm. that'd be great but that's going to pose a big access mm -hmm. issue which right. is you know a, a real problem i think for the mm -hmm. profession as we deserve to be kind of woven into the healthcare fabric right. of things right I think. well i think too it's it's very hypocritical because on the the pay for outcome it's about okay we got to name this something a pathoanatomical right. diagnosis so sure. let's give it icd-10 diagnosis sure Let's call it low back pain. Okay, this case is worth eight hundred dollars. Let's say right. Okay, so then, um, but then we have the evidence based group that's telling us no, you, you, we can't educate off a pathway anatomical diagnosis. Right. So you have this like weird twist of irony <laughs> that like, right. wait, you're not supposed to call right. anything, but hey, if you want to get paid, you got to call it something. Right. You it's know, a great like point. Yeah. it's like the ICD-10 yeah. about intervertebral yeah. disc yeah, displacement, mean, right? You right. can't necessarily educate that because you don't have the MRI. Right. But then right. in some right. phases we can't order the MRI to then right. call it that. So right. No, we. I mean, dissonance is something that you know when you're working <laughs> with students. You got to be really proactive about let alone with with providers yeah. um no it's a really good point and thankfully you know i will say i think people are starting to acknowledge that in mm -hmm. policy like icd codes are changing for just more wide sweeping chronic pain codes for example right. Right. um acknowledging that these are complex you know biopsychosocial conditions yeah. right um but even then, I'm sure, you know, if I were to follow you all around clinic today, there's a lot of stuff you probably did that you can't monetize. Mm -hmm. that you, that you just did because it was just for the good of the patient right. or something that you did. So, um, <laughs> baking. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, seriously. Yeah. You, know, oh, you, know, yeah. Right, right. you know, whether you're on the phone for 20 <laughs> minutes or you're counseling for 10 minutes, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So, I think it's, you know, if I were to go back to my current position education, how do we still teach those skills really well right how do we uncouple mm -hmm. bad um 
health insurance <laughs> yeah. from good patient care right. while still right. teaching students how to navigate mm -hmm. the former. I think yeah. that's a real challenge because it comes back to a student who's going to say, well, that's great. I don't want to learn this because I can't monetize it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to learn about social determinants health because I can't monetize it. And, and I get it at face value. I would encourage a more holistic picture of, of right. patient care, but I, but I get I get those arguments. Yeah, and I mean we we always say to you we're humanitarians. Like we right. we could probably turn cash tomorrow here right. in Troy, we'd lose a population of our patients. But also, you know, I, I want to treat those patients right. that are on Medicaid, right. and I want right. to treat those patients that are lower income because right. those are the people that probably need the most help. Hundred percent. You know, like it's yeah. just as a, as a society with the opioid epidemic and all yeah. these other things going, like we need to have more portals of entry for those yeah. lower income people and part of that it comes maybe with legislation like now yeah. in, in Missouri we can't see Medicaid patients and which is frustrating you know so like little things like that or, or you know getting in right. network with those is, is difficult right. and so I think like I don't know if there was a little bit more wider spread maybe education to the higher ups yeah. maybe it would make more sense but yeah. I, I don't know yeah uh, no yeah. I think there's a paradox I spent a number of years in community health working mm -hmm. within the St. Louis safety net and um, I'm biased but I think that Patients who are marginalized and underserved benefit more from sort of integrated holistic non-farm therapies um, than otherwise than other patients yeah. might. So, yeah. yeah, that access issue is, is a real um, a real personal thing for me to you know one of the many motivations we have for getting students diverse clinical experiences so more get the opportunity mm -hmm. to see patients who could benefit from their right. care otherwise if they wouldn't have access and maybe they'll go on to a career um in those spaces yeah yeah maybe and maybe that's the the long-term solution too so. is, is having yeah. more opportunities in yeah. those situations I think so. in the vas in the community-based health systems yeah. and things like that and so i i think that's good and and then setting it up so that they aren't taking a giant yeah. pay cut i think and, as they become dumb yeah. as they become more focal in education mm -hmm. right yeah. then it becomes more logical for them to be a progression for a career yeah, love and then as they're integrated you know VA is a good example um, mm -hmm. number of fairly qualified health centers employ chiropractors at a good starting salary right. so as they're integrated like that, it just becomes part of yeah. what you do. You're opening a clinic, and this is a person that, that you hire. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I think a mixed reimbursement model too. So, like, let's just use United Healthcare. Let's say they're going to give us forty four dollars, no matter what we do, if we're in that work. Right. Like allowing us to bill the patient, the difference mm. of that, I think, like solves all problems. Yeah. You know, because you're not going to bill so much to where the patient can't afford it. Right. But you're still softening the blow of the cut. Like to me, that is like right. it's kind of like the out in network but right. the, it should be for the in network and then that way everybody's happy they're you know they get a break on what the the cost is and then the person who is billing they're not going to overbill because that polices itself because they're too high then people aren't going to be there yeah and yeah. i think that's that would that's a solution that yeah. i think makes yeah. a lot that's of a sense great honestly point. yeah the yeah. ability to have a dual fee schedule yeah. in, in in essence sure uh, obviously there's risk involved with that too right. but i mean I, I just had my appendix out and so i had an appendectomy down in orlando florida and so now looking at like the, the eobs coming through there of what they charged and reimbursed and things like that it's just it's pretty insane right, right. what they're able to to yeah, process how intentional but, the markup was exactly and, yeah. exactly and so and again i, I don't think that that's going to get too out of control in our setting because the the we're, the prices are going to be low enough that it's probably not going to be that far. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's a decent solution. Any right. thoughts on that or? Not really. No, I think. Um, I mean, it makes sense, and you know, why it's not happening. I, I think is you probably it's it's legacy players are going to be tough to overcome, right? Yeah. I guess would be the short way I would say yeah. that. So overcoming that, I think, is going to be really tough. And th it's been that way forever. So right, how do you make a change? Yeah. You right. know, that's that's yeah. difficult. So. Yeah, those systems change involve the the legacy players. So exactly. for sure, exactly. So yeah, yeah I mean, we, we kind of talked about the future of, of healthcare a lot. We talked about a little bit about the future of education yeah. too. Anything like uh, you know, let's say in twenty years you're you're done, right? You're finally done in, in administration and stuff like that. I don't know if twenty <laughs> years is your goal, but whatever that might be. What, what what would be like it, you could look back and say, wow, that was like I made a big change or, you know, like what are what are a couple of your big things that you really want to see happen in the next 10 to 15 years? So I think uh, for me, it comes down to the patients and the students. I know that sounds a little corny, but but it's true. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd be really proud if I was part of building a system where students were excited to engage in clinical education. They were excited to take that clinical education and knew they had really good 
practice opportunities and options mm-hmm. because of that. Yeah. Um, and that's tough to measure. Sure. I understand that. But um, I, I think that's what really motivates me mm-hmm. is providing really enriching clinical education opportunities because I know it's going to pay off. Yeah. I, you know, even if a um, particular student might not know it yet, I know if they get better quality clinical education today, they're going to be so much better for us tomorrow. And I know the patient downstream yeah. is going to be better for that too. Love um, I, I would love to see something more concretely. I warm. Before you up this episode, guys, hope you're enjoying it real quick. We have an amazing, amazing opportunity. The DNS World Congress is coming to Chesterfield, Missouri this June 14th through the 16th, 2024. If you guys attended our NDS or our Neurodynamics Congress, you know that we, uh, this is uh, something that's very close to Brett and I's heart, something that we are going to keep doing and keep doing and keep doing. So this year's Congress is all about DNS, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. This is literally uh, like looking into the ocean, as Brett says. This is the lens that we look through each and every one of our patients with. And this is going to be an amazing opportunity because Pavel is back in town. So the originator, the creator of DNS, Pavel Kolash, is coming to the stage for the first time in five or six years. I don't even know how long it's been. Uh, he's bringing along with him Elena Kobosova, which is literally the backbone of DNS. Uh, she's one of the most underrated neuro- neurologists in the world. Uh, so we're super excited to hear from her. Uh, Marcella Safarova, if you haven't heard her speak, uh, she is literally the queen of pediatrics and musculoskeletal health. Uh, we also are going to have Ever, almost every single U.S. instructor at the uh, at the Congress who's going to be speaking. It's going to include demos, lectures, hands-on. Uh, we're going to have, as always, a, a get-together afterwards with your chance to talk to these guys uh, face-to-face and have a couple drinks with them. This is going to be a great, great opportunity. There's also, it's a great price too, especially for students. It's only $4.99. Uh, so be sure to use the code DNS student uh, to get your discount on that. Uh, for more information or if you have questions, go to gestaltedu.com backslash DNS dash Congress. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Enjoy the rest of the episode. See us advance a model where Distributed learning is the norm mm-hmm. and where diverse clinical rotations are the norm as well. Yeah. So chiropractic students, if I were to focus on our chiropractic program, um, get the opportunity to learn in different systems. Yeah. And, and lastly, we have other programs that I, my department participates with. So it's not just chiropractic program, mm-hmm. naturopathic medicine um, is another example. I would love to see us advance a model of whole person integrated education that includes all those disciplines, learning how to function together for the betterment Medicine of the patient. Orthopedic surgery, things like that. That too, that yeah. too. But also um, our, our integrative oh, okay. providers as well, Got naturopathic it. medicine. Um, acupuncturists. Called acupuncturists, then colleagues on the behavioral health side, mm-hmm. et cetera. You know, non-drug, holistic-minded yeah. folks. Right. Better working together in the education. Um, and I think we have the opportunity to do that uh, at Western States because we have these different programs. We have that uh, holistic mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm excited to see what we can craft in the education space as far yeah. as that's concerned. Now, so, Western States, are they sharing classrooms like in those different programs or is, are they separated? I think the naturopathic students early on have some crossover with our chiropractic students. Yeah. Um, we've got really strong functional medicine programs and nutritional programs as well. So there's a lot of collab in the master side and, and the doctor side, I believe. Um, so we got lots of crossover there as well. Yeah. Cool. Um, you know, it's tough to separate these things, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, I was I was learning from you, Brett, as you were getting into nutritional therapy i think and, mm-hmm. and functional medicine what maybe a decade ago or yeah um imagine having that just standard education as a student right yeah. right how much would your learning curve as a clinician you think been been accelerated oh yeah and i mean like you see it even in like in our local high school here like they are they are already like when they're a sophomore even a freshman like the kids that are going more in the traits like they start to try to yeah. cater their education you know, as a sophomore right. in high yeah. school, even like toward that track, which yeah. I think is really, really yeah. cool. Yeah. I mean, they're still kind of working out some of the details, but I mean, that actually makes a lot of sense. Instead yeah. of, you know, the people that are dropping out of high school, it's because they're basically uninterested. It's right. like, you know, you might as well be being educated in the track that you're you're thinking you're heading towards, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I mean, that's where like, it, you know, like if we use functional medicine example, like it's very hard for people to mix functional medicine with what we do in a treatment room with, you know, like right. some people can do it, but most people can't like, right. So it's almost like you need to almost like mm. have a demarcation line of like, Go what it is you interesting. I'm Go, doing yeah. this and then I'm doing that. Uh-huh. Hmm, interesting. You know, that brings up one other, you asked what would success look like? And I think, uh, one thing we talk about a lot is increasing access to education, mm. right? Uh, whether it's underrepresented minorities or other individuals who otherwise wouldn't have access to a chiropractic education. Um, one, it just it's just the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And then it's got positive consequences as well as increasing representation mm-hmm. in, in the workforce, which has so many important clinical um, implications and, and public health and, and 
you know, just at a, at a humanistic level as well. So that would be another, I think, indicator of success. Mm -hmm. Or were we able to increase access to, to education? Right. right. What does that access look like, Ethan? Is that mainly a financial standpoint? Is that a uh, maybe making it easier awareness. to get your yeah? yeah I mean, financial okay. support, awareness, yeah. um, support on the back end with an only career coaching, maybe bridge type programs to provide employment, uh, right. all sorts of things like that. I think yeah. and thinking it through holistically from the admissions piece all the way through mm -hmm. to the alumni piece and everything in between. I think too having these uh, these kind of mixed programs where you could you could finish your bachelor's degree yeah. at a place like Western States or right. you know other chiropractic schools. I think that that's another great way because to, to your point, Brett, you know maybe a four year degree is somewhat of a waste of time towards the end when you can have if you know you're going to chiropractic school right. to be able to finish right. your education your. I don't want to say undergrad, but you know that right. under un, right. not further education at a place like Western States would probably be a good demarcation. One, it'd probably cheaper financially, and then right. two, get to the end goal quicker. Yep, yep. And even with that, more and more you'll see discussions on competency-based education and, and graduate, you know, mm -hmm. programs as well, right? Does chiropractic need to be a three and a half four-year program? Mm -hmm. Can it be? three for me but it was two for you yeah and, and those sorts of things so competency based learning in general um there's a whole, whole bunch of potential hybrid learning models and um the role technology plays in that as well. Right. And, yeah. I think like the business schools really have this figured out where like if you want to get your MBA, you you have to go work for two years mm. and then, because then basically you see like where your right. your voids are and what you're not good at. And I think like is right. it the typical chiropractic student, they don't know what they don't know. So they're right. like, they're being bored with information right. that if right. they saw it a year yes. from now, they'd be like, whoa, I cannot believe. You know. So you just reminded me of another big initiative we're doing is in our chiropractic program, our community-based education is really two things. We've talked a lot about the, the first, which is a capstone, a nine-month capstone. Mm -hmm. So you do your preclinical work, you do your early clinical work, and then you do a nine-month capstone. And that's really important. That's where a lot of our energy is. The second thing, to your point, that's really important to me and, and to our leadership is to also weave community-based experiences throughout the education, mm -hmm. starting in quarter one. Cool. So you never lose context for what you just mentioned, right? Why am I learning this? Well, here's the context mm -hmm. for it. Um, that's something I'm really excited about because I think once uh, students become aware of all the clinical opportunities and kind of what practice looks like, um, the more they're going to be excited about their studies and the more they're going to be excited about their subsequent community placement as well. Keep giving them breadcrumbs throughout the whole, keep them entertained. Yeah, Show yeah. Them the it, light you know, the make tunnel. it appropriate so it's not yeah. way above their head, but at the same sure. time, stretch them a bit. You know, we yeah. want to see growth. And yeah. I think, you know, in general, our students, they do a wonderful job mm -hmm. and they're more capable than we probably give them credit for. So we can push them earlier and yeah. they'll rise to the occasion, I think. For sure. So, yeah, no, I think and so I think too. they'll be excited too. I think, I think they'll be really excited to be in clinic earlier and to be learning earlier. And, um, well, so. I think, because uh, I think a hard part with education is a lot of that. Uh, gusto and a lot of that like future forward looking comes from outside the schools right you know like you right. have a it's seminar yeah right. you have a seminar rolling right. and you have someone that you know kind of blows a student's mind and then oh my gosh like boom that's it right. versus having it actually integrated within the curriculum right i think is i think it's a great idea right. i think it's a great point and i think that's you know something we need to reconcile mm -hmm. is how do we learn from folks right and continuing education who are outside our yeah. traditional spaces um and how do we inform each other mm -hmm. too right it's it's always helpful to be unburdened by regulations and so <laughs> on i mean that, that's where innovation can happen more naturally it right. comes from the outside um but you know we can learn internally as well and i think my experience has been at least traditionally you know going through chiropractic school and being early career chiropractor these are very siloed things the yeah. continuing education seminar market and uh education yeah. what's, what's your opinion on yeah that? i agree i i 100 percent agree because like even even it's a difficulty with getting your continuing education credits for example you mm. know how so many people we have to be accredited through a chiropractic school to have you know appease a lot of the continuing education requirements or right. to get the courses approved and so which is difficult because schools don't necessarily want to do that mm. because then it takes money out of their pockets from the continuing education mm. uh, right. like curriculum you know right. and so i think finding a way of of finding the happy medium there of like you said getting a little bit out of the constraints of the schooling so that you have some more innovation and maybe some more uh 
different thinking, if mm-hmm. you will, but still having that integrated in so that you still have a connection to the school. So, right. you know, as an alumni, uh, sure. has other things like that. Sure. You know, I think that, that that to me, being on the continuing education or like a, you know, a bandit or an outsider, that's right. the difficulty with getting still integrated into the schools. Right. Some of the ed- continuing education is maybe a little bit more alumni based and a, more like uh, just as this is kind of what we've been doing. This is what we teach here. We're going to continue going versus bringing sure. in different ideas, thoughts, sure. and, and realms. Or if you if you commit to an institution, Western <clears throat> States or Parker, Cleveland, wherever you're going, um, is it that school's responsibility for you? Not only the day you graduate, but like you know, like yeah. down the road and some of continuing education that they could be included in. Because right now. I'm not going to speak for every student across the world that comes through here. They're a little bit jaded because they feel like they didn't get $200,000 worth of education. So maybe that education could be extended on, mm-hmm. and the school can maybe feel a little bit right. of that responsibility to, right. to at least offer it up and if they if people don't take advantage of that. Right. And I think with virtual learning, that's probably definitely probably a possibility. I agree. Uh, I think you'll see a lot more um, improved quality you know, virtual asynchronous options. Um, but you're right. I, th- I think it is somewhat a responsibility of the institution to at least keep engaged and provide the opportunity in the platform. And then um, should alumni want to take advantage of it, you know, there's something there for it. Yeah. Kind of the debate that's festering right now is that, um, do you think that the future chiropractor should be a primary care musculoskeletal specialist, mm. meaning you're able to, you know, be a primary care portal of entry, but you're staying in that lane? Or do we continue to strive to be like a true primary sure. care physician where people are coming in with emergent situations? And then, right. and I think, and I, I honestly don't have the answer. I, sure. I mean, I see both sides of it, but sure. do you have an opinion on like what maybe, I don't know, what Western States opinion is or what your opinion is on. Right. Right. So my, well, I I would answer that two ways. My opinion to make that clear is I think that question is, it's almost, um, almost a dated question in the sense that we are so team based now and, and so enabled by technology support that I, I think that the true primary care provider role is handled by a lot of different things, a lot of different people, different disciplines and different tools. Also, I think that even if you were a primary musculoskeletal clinician, um, I mean, even let's pick on back pain. If you're working with someone who has chronic back pain, uh, chances are they have another chronic musculoskeletal condition, Mm -hmm. knee osteoarthritis, what have you. Chances are their behavioral or emotional components to that as well. Um, You're going to address all those things. So, you know, I'm not a reductionistic person. I don't believe in reducing to that level. I I think it's a holistic sort of approach. Mm -hmm. And that's my opinion. So I think you're still going to be a, you're going to be a doctor caring for a patient. Is your emphasis going to be on the presenting complaint? Probably. Is that going to be your niche in the healthcare system, helping patients feel and function better as a physical function expert? Probably like for most, for most practicing chiropractors. Um, You know, as far as Western States as an institution, I think it's our, Goal. In fact, I know it's our goal to train well-rounded providers, mm-hmm. providers who are going to feel comfortable functioning in different healthcare domains, who are going to have the skill set to function as a portal of entry provider, um, but also going to have the expertise to recognize that the majority of patients are going to be caring for have physical function related complaints and all the things that come with it right. and are, are going to be more so team based and evidence informed. Yeah. To be able to make the appropriate yeah. triage. Yeah. 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 What, what do you think? What I know you say you don't have an opinion, but uh, I mean, sure it gets gotta... awkward like in the functional medicine space because then you are actually looking at multiple systems of the body that right. maybe somebody who's just working with back pain is not. So sure. then selfishly, I like being a primary care physician right. in that world. Um, but then and I hate to say this, but do I trust all our colleagues to be making really good primary care decisions throughout their day? Probably not. Right. Right. Um, Especially when it comes the, to things like medications. I mean, if you listen to a heart for, yeah. if you listen to, you know, five people's heart in school, does that make you qualified to right. listen to someone's right. heart out? Right. And, you know, so, I mean, I think that's where like the consumer is very confused right now because we're, toting ourselves as primary care physicians, myself included. So, right. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of that. So, but like the rest, is that a good thing moving forward? Does there need to almost be like a delineation where you have like a nurse and you have a nurse practitioner where you have like more training that's involved to allow you to be mm-hmm. able to do that? Or, or you know, is it just going to go practice, on? you know, 
space is sort of touches on this still more in the musculoskeletal realm right and different mm -hmm. states have advanced practice certificates where you can do yeah. procedures and so on um but to, none to with real point. teeth that people right. would kind of know you to, know right right to that to that level that you're describing the delineation yeah. i think you know i guess i would challenge a little bit i would imagine most people go to a chiropractor looking for certain things and kind of knowing what they're going to get right um so I'm not sure it's as big of an issue, that branding of it. Right. Um, I, well, it's probably just us being a little bit more integrated with the outside stuff that we do. Right. You know, it's, probably it's so. the 5% the, the of people that we have this probably issue so. versus the, the 95 in the profession. You know, I would say from an educational standpoint, the general framework of education we, we aim to promote to our students is evidence-informed, um, having the requisite skill set of a physician like mm -hmm. there's a patient at the center of it so what are all the core components of good patient care um and, and once you're patient centered I, I think you know and i'm you do this intuitively things aren't exclusive i mean mm -hmm. you know certainly you can help someone with their diabetes and should and if i have a patient who's diabetic and check their feet and ask them if they've seen the eye doctor and so on uh, these aren't exclusive things right, right. We, mm -hmm. we can just be good clinicians yeah. and we can work with colleagues who are also good clinicians yeah, yeah that's, that's you know that's, that's probably the right answer probably well, like a naive good take on it but no, i think no, that's no. if we think of it that way a good analogy for you would be since you're a well-trained act bar um, you've seen people out in the wild that are right. reading x-rays right. with crazy right. interpretations right. of stuff. Right. And you have to have a moment when you're like, you right. shouldn't even be giving your opinion right. on this. Right. Although you have a degree to be able to give yeah. an opinion on it. I think that's fair. And I think that's, you know, clinical education is a big motivator for me in part for that reason. So, I, you know, I spent three years in a residency, one year in a fellowship. And I knew when I came out of that, you know, and I'm very thankful. I mean, I had, you know, the best mentor in the profession, Dr. Norm Kedner. So, I, you know, I knew when I came out of that, I, I was very well prepared. You know, I knew I could go into any radiology room and, and yeah. hang with anyone. Only not because of me, just because of the function of the education I had. Um, so that's a big motivating force for me to, yeah. I think, the more we can have rigorous real world experiences with students, I think the more, not only they're going to develop more comfort, they're going to get a more of a reality check on their expectations and learn how to be team based as, as well. Right. I think, uh, I think okay. that's, that's probably the solution right there is what you're saying is, is getting more into the wild, yeah. understanding where your holes are and things like that. Yeah. So there's also a little bit of, you kind of brought up the asynchronous learning and, and more of the online components and stuff yeah. like that. You know, through COVID we, you know, we have a, had a portion of students that were all online in their right. first, whatever, five trimesters right. and stuff. And so one of the concerns we have is, you know, we love manipulation more than anything, but right. Is there any fear with um, having these types of things that we've taken away some of the hands-on training that I feel like is is pretty damn important in this right. first year? Right. Is there any is there any thoughts on that? Um, is there is there still a, uh, you know a big push to to get hands-on early? Where, where are we seeing like that in education? There's a big push to get hands-on early, and hands-on would be inclusive of clinical experiences as well. And that's mm -hmm. sort of where my headspace definitely at. I would love to see students in a clinical environment, like right away, mm -hmm. not doing all the things, talking to a patient mm -hmm. and then grooming a patient and then palpating. And you know, mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. It, it demystifies it. It makes right. you comfortable with your hands and, and so on and so forth. Um, so yes, there's a big push for hands-on learning. I think we need to reframe how we're thinking about teaching a lot of these psychomotor yeah. skills though. Quite frankly, I think we need to, to be more thoughtful about how we can structure it. Mm -hmm. Do we need to have more mass practice in a shorter period of time for skill mm -hmm. acquisition as opposed to one hour a week over X right. number of weeks? I think there's different ways to go about from like a learning, you know, a good practices and learning yeah. standpoint. Right. Um, because what could potentially happen is as the basic sciences, we know definitely could be hybrid. Right. So oh, that's one through three. Right. And then if we're kicking them out and try eight, well, then you basically have a year you know what I'm saying? Like, sure. So real quickly, without even realizing, you're like, well, gosh darn, I'm only on campus for one year of a three and a half year program. Right. You right. know? Yeah. I mean, if things were ever to go to that, I think if you're intentional about that year, as an example that you gave, um, you get make tremendous progress mm -hmm. in, in right. physical skills. If everything skills. was focused and you kind of cut out. If, the, yeah. If yeah. you were thoughtful about yeah. how you went about it. Yeah. Um, if, you know, you all are, you're on the outside, but you're like, your chiro education adjacent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were to start a program tomorrow. How would you structure it? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think we get back to that question that I asked you before on like, what is the goal of what we're doing? Because if we, if we right. look at 
the fluff, and right. this is in any education, right. Right. it would be, <laughs> you'd be there's, like, there's, oh my gosh, you know. So I think like, I can't think of another profession where the education looks so different than what actually gets done all day long in a treatment room. Right. So like, you know, reverse engineering that and saying, okay, so what are the skills or the competencies we need to be successful with what the average chiropractor is having to do in a treatment room every day? Um, and I think that would be a great starting point. And then real quickly, you'd start whittling stuff out. Yeah. Like, you know, well, and I think you, like you were saying, like, is it, is the goal to be uh, a manual therapist or, you know, like right. where, where do you draw that delineation? Like manual therapy is a huge part of what we do, but it's not necessarily a huge part of what everybody does in the profession. However, to your point earlier, if somebody walks into a chiropractor's office, like what is the preconceived notion that they're going to get? They're probably going to think that they're going to get manipulation. Right. So like, how do we, how do we make the people good enough at assessment and then knowing when and where to use that powerful tool that we have, AKA manipulation or manual therapy, you know, to, to get them up to speed that way when the patient does walk in, like there's, there's enough there that, that we know. Right. Yeah. If that right. makes sense. Yeah. So that's sure. where I would structure it. Like me personally, I would, I would structure the hands-on component, uh, a little bit more front end that way on the back end, once you understand the psychomotor skill of manipulation, you right. understand what you're looking for with palpation and assessment, then you can apply it clinically based on a community based environment, based on clinical practice and things like that. And how to get the whole faculty lockstep. Um, I think, we all know like in, in you know in s certain places like you have everybody who you have all these different opinions and philosophies and if you're a student you would get right. to try six and i mean you would just have to be like what i mean i don't even know who to believe i right. mean i've been told something 20 different ways right so of course they're leaving school confused and of right. course they're right. spending all their money on weekend seminars because like there's no direction it's mm -hmm. like everybody's you know telling them a different thing and right. that, that wouldn't happen in really right. any other profession and that's where context throughout the education becomes really important the getting the real world experiences throughout yep. helps you contextualize that helps you ask good questions uh -huh. right? you know and, and push academicians to get good answers mm -hmm. i think what success looks like from a chiropractic graduate today is someone who um, obviously is is very good with their hands that goes without saying, but additionally has a, has a high uh, soft skill mm -hmm. collection. You know, they're emotionally intelligent. They understand the health system. Mm -hmm. um, they know how to navigate the health system and they know how to change their practice behaviors and habits relative to their practice environment. I sure. think if we can get to that point where someone can step into private practice today and then they can go into a hospital tomorrow and they know how to change things mm -hmm. a little bit all for the good of the patient. Um, I think that's a successful I think everything graduate. you said relative to the patient there in front of that. Right. Because, I mean, we got to wear a different hat right. like 30, yes. 30 times a day. Right. You know, right. like and that's actually. And that's really where the awesome. soft skills come in. That's where the emotional you intelligence comes in, right? You got to know yeah. how to, you know, when to push, when to pull. You got to know, like, if someone comes in with a real flare up of pain, right? Mm -hmm. Is it something anatomic? Or is it something else? And mm -hmm. and it's better to know who the patient is, right? That's the old quote in medicine. It's better to know who the patient is than the disease they have. So, right. um, but we can't let that just come implicitly. We have to teach people that, and, uh, or we can intentionally teach people that. I think the better clinicians we're we're gonna have. And we both share a mentor. You um, way more for you than me, but with Dr. Kettner, yeah. and that. The one thing I always say about Dr. Kettner that he really taught me was the importance of creating um, a differential diagnosis, yeah. like. Because in a way, you're kind of gambling. You need, yep. There's a 70% chance it's this, and not every time it's going to be in that 70%. So knowing how to work down that. Right. Um, what are some of the things with being around Dr. Kevin? Oh, my that, gosh. What are his gold medals that people might not I, know about? Yeah, I can't even. I, I mean, he's definitely, and this is an unbiased, objective truth, he's definitely the most um, underrated, I think, chiropractor of all time. Right. I think he, you know, truly, he's, um, he, he's just a, uh, a beacon in the profession. Yeah. Um, I think for me, so, so many things, and this, he's, he's almost, um, well, I would say this, he's been able to teach core clinical topics, right? You mentioned clinical reasoning, how to think probabilistically and so on pathophysiology, how to think on things on a, just a really focused level. 
But then he would step out and he would have conversations on the social determinants of health and the biopsychosocial model. And, you know, no one was talking about that in our education 10, 15 years ago. And he is, he's talking about that. And so how to not think exclusively, I think is a big one. If I were to summarize it, Mm -hmm. how to be curious, you know, how to, how to stay humble and learning. And, um, those are skills, you know, you can take with you. He always really had a pro chiropractic message too, you know, like for that, he had a forward thinking view of healthcare Mm -hmm. and what it should be. And, you know, and, and that goes back to his holistic viewpoint, right? He thinks in terms of systems and he would always say, you know, if you walk into the hospital and you were injured, you know, you had a knife wound or whatever, like that's where you want biomedicine, right? That's, that's where biomedicine shines. But if you have diabetes and back pain and retinopathy and chronic kidney disease, you want someone and a team of people who think holistically and think in terms of systems and how the systems interact. And um, I think that's what made him pro chiropractic is he had a very holistic and integrative and does have a very holistic and, and integrative viewpoint. I, I would 100% agree. Yeah. Very understated in yes. our profession. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's criminal that more people don't know who Mike Kainer is besides people that went to Logan. I, I agree 100%. Yeah. 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 yeah, 100%. Beautiful. Well, man, we covered a lot of different things there. So, Pat, I really appreciate it. We, we, we put your feet against the fire, and I appreciate people that are willing to, to answer tough questions. And, you know, I think like conversations like this, we always talk about on the podcast, conversations like this hopefully will inspire people beyond our years yeah. to have these conversations, come up with solutions, and then apply them. And so I commend you for taking your skills and applying them <laughs> to this realm. And I, I think you're you're really onto something with community-based learning. I think when done right, it is, uh, it is the the biggest thing that will fast track uh, a clinician in their life and in their skills as a as a as a physician, and so awesome. I think that's the that's the route awesome. we keep doing. So cool. we we didn't talk a single thing about ultrasound or radiology, wow. really, wow. which is pretty impressive. We'll have so to do it again. yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. We'll come out to Western States once you get settled in, that's and we'll right. we'll, uh, we'll take a tour, and That'd then we'll great. we'll do it out there. We so. have a bunch of listeners who will be looking for interns. So how do yeah. they get a hold of you? For you can just email either cbce at uws.edu. Um, or me, P. Battaglia at uws.edu, and we'll get the ball rolling. Go to uws.edu website mm-hmm. and just click on the community based page as well, and that'll help. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things we focused on chiropractic education, which, right. which is appropriate, right? We're all chiropractors. Um, so, to that, there's a lot of things that we just like don't like to talk about. Mm-hmm. But I think you're right. The more we can just kind of have these conversations, um, we need to not forget like our values as an institution include being student centered, right? Mm -hmm. We need to embody that. And we do, I feel, I feel really strongly that we do. How do we become student centered? Um, we need to listen to like what's happening and listen to our students and and make changes for that. Um, our motto is for the good of the patient. Mm -hmm. And you know, we need to remember like we're graduating licensed professionals and, if you wanted or needed something done, right, when you had your appendectomy, um, you wanted someone who had done it a bunch of times right. and not just like, it's okay, right. I, I read about it. Yeah, like right. you wanted someone to I get did it. this three times. So yeah. as long as we keep those things like at, at the center, I, I think um, I am excited that of what we can do in community-based learning and then where we can collaborate with well-intentioned uh, expert clinicians such as yourselves on these this initiative. I think it's a flywheel that, that can really take off. I love it. It's commended. I appreciate you. Cool. Really. All well, right. I appreciate this opportunity. This has been fun. Beautiful. Well, guys, good luck with patience, and uh, we'll see you next time, all right? I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us, or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.